just to start, um, I have no financial conflicts of interest. I, I do want to say up front, um, as I'm required, that my views are my own that I discussed today and are not reflective of uh, Kaiser Permanente or the Permanente Medical Group. Um, so to get started, um, I, I like to start talks often with uh, clinical scenarios. These are hypothetical scenarios, but to highlight um, my main points today, uh, by showing the differences in outcomes when the kind of current modern approaches to genetic diagnostics for developmental disabilities are employed. Um, so this old way scenario, again, this is a hypothetical patient. This is not a real patient. Um, this boy presented at nine months of age with gross motor delay, um, not sitting up, that kind of thing, started physical therapy. Somebody checked the CK. That's a lab that's often done related to maybe muscular dystrophies. At 24 months, speech uh, delays were noted and speech therapy was started. At age three, um, the child was diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder and had appropriate guideline-based testing, um, at least related to autism, and we'll go into more detail, a microarray and fragile X. And the child started ABA um, uh, therapy, which is a therapy for uh, children with autism. At age four, the parents had a second child who presented at nine months with a gross motor delay. At age five, the, this child started, um, this again, AB, our first child started kindergarten and was having difficulty in school and had an assessment that led to an, an individual uh, educational plan, an IEP. And then at age six, he had a, a seizure that led to an MRI that was normal and a small gene test that was non-diagnostic. And then at age eight, he was referred to genetics who performed exome sequencing and finally reached a diagnosis. And I think anyone on this call who does clinical genetics work will recognize this story as a kind of a very classic story for uh, someone's odyssey from initial symptoms to a final diagnosis. So this is the current way, the way I would hope it would go. And you know, medicine is never so simple to have the ideal outcome, in, but this is uh, the, the model we should be moving toward. Um, so again, same child, same presentation with gross motor delay. And you'll notice that not a lot was done with the initial motor delay other than physical therapy, which is okay. Um, at 24 months, though, when the speech delays occurred, it was noted that this child was globally delayed, had delays in multiple areas of development, and that led to a referral to genetics and exome sequencing, which yielded a diagnosis at age two instead of age eight. So now this child had additional developmental testing done earlier because of the risks of um, ongoing uh, delays and uh, disabilities, and this led to an autism diagnosis and ABA therapy was started sooner. The parents discovered this was an inherited type of, of developmental disorder and used uh, pre-implantation genetic testing with IVF to have an unaffected child. Um, when the child started, this AB started kindergarten, he already had an IEP ready because this had been anticipated. When he had a seizure, because seizures were known to be part of this hypothetical syndrome and brain findings were rare, an MRI was determined not to be necessary. So, as you can see, even though I did, I was very careful not to imply that uh, highly effective treatments for many developmental, developmental disabilities are likely to result from a diagnosis. I was careful not to include that as an outcome. You can see that there are a lot of benefits from an early diagnosis for the family, for the child, for the care team and, and, and uh, avoiding unnecessary testing. And so most of the rest of the talk is gonna be talking about how we get to this this ideal scenario, at least as often as, as we can. Um, so in two words, my thesis today, these are what you remember today, is that genetic testing for developmental disabilities should be done early. And there's always an asterisk with this. Um, there's such thing as too early. Some children with mild delays you know, improve quickly and that's all there is. But early when it's clear that there are global or significant delays and comprehensive, meaning the testing should be as broad as is, as is reasonable and feasible given the technology at the time. And again, lots of complexity there that we'll talk about. But um, these two words, early comprehensive, are the name of the game, uh, so to speak, today with genetic diagnosis for developmental disabilities. Um, this is a paper I'd like to start sort of 101, 102 level talks with. Um, this, it's already a little bit old now, it's, it's four years old, but it's still a great review. And, um, I'd recommend anybody interested in learning more about rare disease diagnosis to take a look at this, this paper. Um, the study reviewed the diagnostic yield, that is the fraction of people, in this case children, with specific clinical presentations that are able to achieve a genetic diagnosis. 
And you can see that the numbers range quite widely. So things like uh, you know, hearing loss or retinal disease are more than 50%. Cognition, intellectual disability, about 40% in this particular cited study. Behavioral disorders at a lower rate. Uh, cardiovascular at a lower rate. And so you can see, and these numbers are changing. They, um, they are based on whatever the latest science on that topic is. But the point is that many pediatric conditions and adult too, as we'll hear uh, later in this conference, uh, have a have some fraction have an underlying genetic etiology that is detectable today. Lower yield situations, things like isolated cleft lip and palate, non-syndromic congenital heart disease, isolated autism, which I'll focus on later because this is about developmental uh, disorders, and joint hypermobility are conditions that have a fairly low yield from a genetic evaluation. What kind of tests are used? So there's tons and tons of tests in genetics. I'm not gonna be able to go into all of them, but again, this figure from the same paper that I've been talking about is a really good illustration of the major tests used uh, in diagnosing developmental disorders. Um, the main theme, as I know there's a lot on this slide, is that as the tests become more sophisticated, which is on these, the two lines on the bottom, the diagnostic yield goes up, but the fraction of findings that may be difficult to interpret uh, also goes up. And that's not bad, but it just gives you an idea of the complexity. So a chromosomal test that looks just at the chromosomes under a microscope, a genetic test that's been around for more than 50 years, um, that would, might be used to diagnose something like Down syndrome. Um, um, that's a, that test has very few inconclusive type of results, um, but it also only detects a small number of disorders. When we talk about exome or genome sequencing, which are tests that sequence either all of the DNA, which is the genome, or all of the coding DNA, all of the genes, which is, excuse me, which, which is what exome is, yields tens of thousands, if not millions of DNA differences. And so the informatic, these software and, and human element that goes into interpreting these tests is simply much more demanding. In the middle, we have a test called a microarray, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, that's a test that looks for extra or missing DNA. It's commonly used as a diagnostic test for developmental disorders um, and doesn't sequence the DNA directly. It looks to see if the DNA is there in the normal number of copies. Again, the same paper, just a great overview of pediatric uh, disease diagnosis. Um, another important concept to understand is specifically for developmental disorders is the relationship between the specificity of a phenotype, that means how um, unique a person's clinical features are, and the number of genes involved are related, in that the more unique a person's uh, a clinical presentation, a clinical feature, the phenotype, as we call it, the more unique, the fewer genes associated with it is the general pattern. And so we see something like cystic fibrosis. There's one gene that causes cystic fibrosis, and it's a very unique pattern of features to cystic fibrosis. At the other extreme, we see intellectual disability. Um, intellectual disability is the very much more complex than uh, and, and not as not as specific as the organs involved in cystic fibrosis, and therefore, not surprisingly, has many more genes associated with it. And that is why genetic testing related to intellectual disability needs to look at a lot of genes. Uh, trying to narrow testing, which is um, what I had spoken about in that kind of first scenario earlier on is, is difficult when the potential genes involved are, are many. So what tests are used to evaluate intellectual disability? So we talked about a microarray that has been recommended as a first line test since 2010 uh, for children with autism or uh, developmental delays or multiple anomalies. Next generation sequencing, which is the technology behind exome and genome sequencing. Again, exome looking at the genes and genome looking at the genes plus the DNA between them, which is not as well understood. Fragile X um, is often tested on its own because of the nature of the DNA lesion in Fragile X, and it is a cause of uh, developmental disorders. And then targeted genetic or biochemical testing, which I, I use the word targeted a lot because as I'll come back to, in the context of a uh, developmental disorder without a really clear additional features that suggest a metabolic condition, um, a lot of tests are not very high yield. They don't, they're not often likely to give a diagnosis and they may not be a cost-effective approach. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit too. So again, a word on microarrays. They've been first line 
for developmental disorders since 2010, but they are becoming a little more obsolete because exome and genome technologies are able to detect copy number differences, that is extra or missing DNA, um, more robustly. And um, I haven't seen any official word, but I would say that um, many now accept that uh, exome or genome is similar, if, in, in, for, in the case of genome, possibly better than array uh, for detecting um, most copy number variants. There are many different platforms for running arrays. There isn't one array. Every lab that does it does it a little bit differently. Um, one technology, which is called comparative genomic hybridization, basically takes a patient sample, a reference sample, mixes them together, and looks to see how they compete. If there's more DNA with the patient, it will compete better, and you'll see that signal as an increased signal. If there's more DNA in the reference sample, meaning there's missing DNA in the patient sample, that will show up as reduced DNA, a reduced signal, excuse me. And those can be linked to positions on a chromosome. And there are many genetic conditions due to extra or missing DNA. Um, you know, a 22Q deletion syndrome or DeGeorge syndrome is the most common, what we call micro deletion. That is a deletion that is too small to be seen with a microscope, but can be readily seen on a microarray. And that disorder does, in, in some cases, cause developmental disabilities. Next generation sequencing, the technology behind exome and genome takes the patient's DNA uh, represented here in these rainbow bars, shreds it, sequences the little pieces, and then reconstructs it in a computer to generate an, a, the patient's sequence, which can then be compared to databases to determine if there are any differences that might be clinically meaningful. Now, there are um, some limitations. So the patient's genome looks like this. There are these boxes are genes, and the in between are they could be introns, they could be areas between genes. The point is that our DNA contains sequence that we know what it does and sequence that we don't know what it does, and that's what's represented here. Um, and there can be missing pieces, but the test sees fragments. Next generation sequencing technologies that are used clinically today are what we call short read. They look at very small pieces of the DNA, and so it can be hard to see, for example, that this red box is only present in one copy just by counting the number of red boxes. So some things that um, next generation testing doesn't see, these aren't to be memorized. I'm just trying to make the point that no test today is perfect. So um, some genes uh, are not fully sequenced. There's parts of the gene that for whatever reason are difficult to sequence or maybe um, aren't even, in, even coding that we don't, we don't know what the function of that region of the gene is and they aren't tested. Um, methylation defects, so disorders like uh, Prader-Willi syndrome can be caused by disorders that aren't due to a change in the sequence, but are due to changes in a, a modification of the DNA, and that requires dedicated testing. Repeat expansion, so fragile X or Huntington disease, um, are caused by expansions of a recurrent sequence in a gene. And some next generation technologies have difficulty seeing that, although there's progress in that front. Deletions, like we talked about, um, although again, that's also improving and technologies now are more able to see deletions, especially multiple exon deletions. Um, and then chromosomal disorders like a translocation where a piece of a chromosome is moved to another chromosome. When you shred the DNA up, that information is lost. Um, there are technologies that can detect all of these, um, but the ones that can do them all, do the, the detection all in one test, as far as I know, are still research technologies. So now that we've talked about the tests, let's talk a little bit about how they perform in, the, in diagnosing uh, intellectual disability. So this is from a, a review. Um, it's 2015, it wasn't that long ago, but it feels like it, <laughs> in, at least in terms of progress. And so we can see that the number of genes uh, related to intellectual disability has gone up consistently and has gone up much more quickly since the advent of array and then um, exome and genome technologies. And these, these lines would keep, keep going up if we extended this chart to the present day. Um, and similarly, the diagnostic yield has gone up over time. Um, you know, I would say that 60% is, is a little on the optimistic side, but it's not far off. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're coming close to the point, I think, where um, we may be crossing that kind of 50-50 line where, for making diagnoses, especially in cases that are syndromic or have uh, more severe effects and are, are more mild. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so um, when we see, when we do these tests, array ACGHs, that's the microarray test, and then se genome-wide sequencing is exome or, or genome. Um, there are a lot of studies that have been published looking at how frequently a diagnosis is made when 
uh, using these technologies in individuals with developmental disorders. And the number, that final number, the percentage is really different. And so it's important to realize that a lot of what comes out of these studies depends on what went into the studies. So um, patient selection is huge. Some of these studies are looking at patients who've already had extensive genetic workups and are already going to be hard to diagnose. And those studies will have lower yield. Some studies are doing testing on patients who've not had any evaluation. Those will be higher yield. Some studies are taking consecutive patients seen in a particular clinic. Those will be lower yield because they're not selecting carefully. Other studies will handpick patients that are the most likely clinically to have a genetic disorder. Those will have a higher yield. So there's a lot of variation. Um, so higher yield though, clinically, the more severe, this is a general, general pattern. It's not um, an absolute rule. The more severe the developmental disorder, the more likely there is to be a genetic cause that we can identify today. Um, syndromic features, so that means not just delays, but either facial or organ system differences um, also increase the probability of a genetic cause. And then of course, the lack of alternative explanations, such as maybe prematurity. Um, lower yield are um, features such as on, the, the only developmental concern being isolated autism or mild, milder learning or intellectual disabilities. And um, in, in some cases, because uh, you know, as you can imagine, development and, and intellect and cognition are very complex. Um, it's also known that some people's differences in their abilities are multifactorial and due to many genes. And so in sometimes if there's a family history of very mild uh, cognitive differences, um, that might imply a polygenic um, process in that family that is not amenable to genetic diagnosis today. Our tests today are limited to finding single gene causes of, of, um, of, any, of anything really, um, developmental disorders, but anything. Uh, genetic processes that totally exist that are caused by many genes acti acting together are still not, not completely, but pretty much completely inaccessible to diagnostic testing today. Um, so this study here that I'm showing you the, the front page of, um, this is, this is, there's many studies like this, but I like this one, so I'm, I'm showing it. They looked at global developmental delay or intellectual disability. Um, overall, the array uh, diagnosed 8.4% and exome 26.2%, which leads to a total diagnostic rate of in the 30% range, which is about an average number that you'll see uh, from many of these studies. Um, and you can see that the number goes up when there are syndromic features, when there's macro or microcephaly and goes down when um, there aren't syndromic features as I, as I discussed. And I'll come back to this study in, in some other context in, in, in a moment. In terms of how developmental disorders are inherited, um, this is uh, just a graph from one study, but many studies have shown a very similar pattern, which is that was, was actually a surprise is that a lot of them are actually dominant. That means it's a single gene, one copy, one of the two copies is affected. And, um, but it's not inherited, it's a new mutation. And so that was actually, I think, a surprise in the field. There was a, uh, perhaps the, the impression that if a child had a developmental disorder and the parents did not, that it was either X-linked in a boy or recessive, meaning the parents were carriers and the child inherited a, a double dose, if you will, um, and is therefore affected. Um, but it actually turned out that a lot of developmental disabilities are new mutations, that that's, and that's why there's no family history. Um, although I think that that number will probably go down, the fraction of developmental disorders that are due to new mutations, because I think that we'll, we'll discover um, more genes and we'll also discover that uh, more complex multi-gene causes, there'll be a new, a new uh, wedge on this pie, not just X-linked, recessive and dominant, but there'll be a new wedge for multigenic. And that will take a little bite maybe out of the, the dominant and make it <laughs> a smaller percentage. But, um, but there's some, there's some you know, important conclusions from the observation that a lot of developmental disorders are due to new mutations. One is that the empiric risk for siblings is lower than we thought um, because it might, the odds of a new mutation happening twice are not zero, but they're fairly low. It also emphasizes the importance of TRIO testing, the way that it's possible to determine that a genetic difference was de novo, was not inherited from the parents, which is a major red flag for being abnormal. Um, is to have the parents tested at the same time. And so the, the standard, if possible, when doing um, exome or genome testing for developmental disorders is to include both parents, if possible. It's not always possible, but when possible, that's, that's the way to go. Um, so in 2021, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics 
um, who's actually national um, annual meeting is happening this, this week, um, issued a statement on the use of exome and genome sequencing for pediatric patients with um, cognitive anomalies, excuse me, congenital anomalies or intellectual disability. And so I'm just gonna read it because they said it better than, than I'm gonna paraphrase it, which is that the literature supports the clinical utility and desirable effects of exome or genome sequencing on active and long-term clinical management of patients with congenital anomalies, developmental delays or intellectual disabilities, and on family-focused and reproductive outcomes with relatively few harms. Compared with standard genetic testing, which is, uh, which I, which is targeted testing, trying to, trying to look at a few genes or a few disorders at a time, compared with standard testing, exome or genome sequencing has a higher diagnostic yield and may be more cost-effective when ordered early in the diagnostic evaluation. And I, I did want to point out that in this study, they stated that isolated autism without intellectual disability or congenital malformation was out of the scope of that recommendation. So I wanted to, to spend a little bit more time on this because they said not only is it um, beneficial, but it's cost effective. There have been a number of studies published in the last several years looking at workflows to diagnose developmental dis, uh, disorders and, um, and the, uh, the the cost effectiveness of those workflows. And so this is a study in, in JAMA Pediatrics where they compared four pipelines, basically. Basic, one was trying to figure out the diagnosis based on clinical features. The second one was trying to figure out the diagnosis and when they were, everyone was ready to give up, doing exome sequencing. And then the, uh, the last two were doing exome without even before trying to figure it out. And they found that the most expensive option per diagnosis was to, was to solve it you know, the old fashioned way by clinical features. Um, the most expensive per patient was to do exome only after an attempt to make a diagnosis based on features. And the most, the least expensive per patient and per diagnosis was to do the most comprehensive workup early. And I think that's, th this is not the only study that has shown this exact same pattern. And I think that's a big reason why the ACMG made the statement that they made is that broad testing is the highest yield and um, so doing it first makes the most sense, if you think about it. And, and so exome has moved from being the test of last resort to really being a first line or second line test. And that is now kind of codified in official guidelines. Um, this is another group um, that, uh, this is a neurodevelopmental disorder um, a review group that published a paper with similar recommending that a person with um, a, a developmental disorder should have an exome first. That is kind of the first line test. If the exome test includes good detection of deleted or duplicated DNA, then that's it. Or a microarray possibly second if, if the exome did not include that testing. Um, the ACMG recognized both workflows as acceptable, a microarray and then a broad sequencing test or a broad sequencing test with or without a microarray um, afterwards, depending on the technology that was used. Um, so what about clinical utility? What's the point of doing all this testing and making diagnoses? So, you know, having, I haven't done it in a while, but having dealt with insurance companies, sometimes there's a bias where like, if it's not curable, it doesn't matter. And that's a little nihilistic. I, I don't, I can't live that way. Um, and the ACMG, um, you know, uh, has their own view. So physicians sometimes vary, but the ACMG in the 2015 statement said that um, genetic results can be useful if they inform treatment or just prognosis, knowing what the future holds, if they inform reproductive decisions for the family, um, if it allows the, the patient or family to be involved in a disease specific support group, which can be very meaningful to patients and families, if it simply saves costs from a wasteful diagnostic odyssey or for benefits to society such as research. Um, and so I, I, you know, I'm a big proponent of making diagnoses, even if there's no treatment for these other reasons. I will say that occasionally there are cases where none of these apply. I've certainly had patients or families come where the patient is older, no one's having children, they're not interested in, in, in a support group and no one's doing tests on them. And occasionally, you know, I, I, to be fair, it, it's not that every case has to have the maximum workup, but I do think it's important to consider all of these uh, parameters uh, before deciding not to pursue an evaluation. Um, so this is kind of trying to put um, what I've spoken about together into a kind of a simplified graph that's, I think, hope, useful, hopefully, for clinical management. And, and um, so this is definitely an oversimplification, but I think it, it, it makes the points really clearly. 
So if we think about neurodevelopment along a spectrum, from on one extreme being neurotypical uh, to the other end having a profound developmental disorder, um, there's a lot in between. And these, again, this is definitely an oversimplification, please forgive me, um, but I'm trying to, trying to make a point. So, you know, in the ID in intellectual disability range, you can be mild, moderate, or severe. On the, I don't want to say milder because I think that doesn't give justice to how some, some of these things can be quite impactful in someone's life, but um, in terms of the degree of impairment, in terms of cognition, you things like ADHD, sensory processing disorders, isolated learning disabilities, maybe dyslexia as an example. Um, and then you have things like high functioning autism or more isolated autism. Um, these, are, these are sort of a spectrum. Again, very oversimplified, but bear with me. I also would add sort of non neurodevelopmental So global delays, not just cognition, but also um, you know, motor delays, uh, you know, ataxia, things like that, that are delays in other areas of development. And then syndromic presentations, which could be anything involving other organ systems. Using this sort of spectrum, I would say that the current common practice and guidelines would recommend that anybody on this side, with this sort of line, um, should have a microarray uh, at a minimum, and anyone on this side should farther should have exome or a similar broad sequencing based test. Um, and I, I, not everyone will agree with me. I'm, I'm not claiming that this is like written in stone, but I, I, as I understand the published guidelines and common practice, I think this is uh, an approximation of, of those. And you will notice that autism has sort of found itself in the middle in the sense that um, there is testing that has been recommended for more than a decade, but it's not necessarily recommended to, to do exome in, in all cases at this time. Um, and so I wanted to spend a minute on that topic looking at diagnostic yield and, and autism. So um, I, I cite a few studies, but there's many on this topic. So um, one that, that piqued my interest was the SPARC autism trial, which was presented at the American Society for Human Genetics conference in 2020. And they, um, they reported an 8% diagnostic rate in autism, half of which were on array. 50%, 52% of them were new mutations, and a lot of them were not maternal, meaning the father wasn't available. This goes back to what I said before, that um, a lot of developmental disorders that are detectable by genetic testing today are new, new mutations. They're not inherited. Um, some are in, in maternal, and there's some evidence that some single gene causes of autism don't affect females as often. And so you, not a high rate, but there can be situations where the mother is not as affected and then a, a son, for example, might be affected. But not a lot of them were clearly you know, recessive or X-linked like we thought most things were. This rate though, the diagnostic rate went up if there was a cognitive or intellectual impairment. Things like seizures increased the risk considerably or if they were nonverbal after age five or had birth defects. And that's a really important point is that the rates of diagnosis of autism go up a lot if there are other physical or neurologic features. And then the diagnostic rate was about 4% if high functioning. And given that half were on array, it's about a 2% yield for additional sequencing. Um, so again, this is the same study I started at the beginning, and we saw you know, diagnostic rates of like you know, 10%, maybe more for array, and 20, 50%, 30% for exome. Those numbers are a lot lower for autism. For uh, looking at all the autistic patients in this study, the diagnostic rate from exome was only 6%. Um, and for isolated autism, it was zero. Um, and the, we didn't start seeing more, ca the cases that had diagnoses from autism all had additional features, epilepsy, micromacrocephaly or other syndromic features. And this is what leads to the common practice, although again, controversial, I will definitely acknowledge that, of um, that, that a broader testing beyond array is not high yield and not necessarily recommended for isolated autism. I will stress, however, that this does put more burden on developmental specialists to clearly delineate between children who meet DSM-5 criteria for autism and who do or do not have additional features. And that's, that's an important thing to, to, be, to be aware of. Sometimes children get diagnosed with autism at young ages, maybe you know, two years or less, and it may be hard to assess for intellectual disability. And it's very important to keep in mind that if, you know, in, in, the, in the future, if that child shows signs of intellectual disability in addition to autism, that the indicated genetic testing increases and they should have that testing. Um, just a few words on Fragile X. 
Um, this is an excellent condition, can definitely cause a range of developmental disorders. There've been a number of studies out questioning whether this should really be the first thing we test. The truth of the matter is if you look at the data that if you take children with you know, predominantly boys with um, developmental disorders and test them fragile X, the fraction that don't have a clear X-linked family history or physical features of fragile X that end up having fragile X is extremely small. Um, the flip side is that fragile X is not routinely tested on, it's not on the array, it's not on an exome. So if you don't test for it, you won't ever catch it. I still test, you know, our, where I work, we still test for fragile X in any autism diagnosis or with developmental delays, but I can tell you that the yield is incredibly low. Um, and I think that eventually the testing will come to a point where there's one test that includes this as part of other things and the, the dedicated testing will go away. It's not unreasonable to keep testing for it, but the yield is low. Um, exome versus genome, this is a topic that comes up. So um, there have been very few head-to-head -head studies. This is one that I found this is not done in the context of, of developmental disorders. This was done in the context of sick infants in the NICU setting. And um, they, they did rapid exome or rapid genome. And the genome performed better on every metric except the final diagnostic rate where they were the same. Um, and I think this just speaks to the fact that the vast majority of the DNA we understand in the genome is in the exome. And so even though genome has some major advantages to it, at the end of the day, we're still learning what the non-coding parts of our DNA do. And so genome does not have a huge lead yet, yet for um, diagnosis over exome. So um, that said, in the literature, there are many examples of diagnoses that were missed by exome that were picked up by genome, but those were in very selected patients. Those are not on a population scale. I've not, if, and if someone's aware, please let me know. I've not seen a population scale head-to-head -head comparison of exome and genome in a, in a large population. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm sure someone's working on that. So that's a good kind of future direction uh, for the field. Um, and then again, practically, <clears throat> exomes have come down considerably in price and genomes are now actually affordable. They used to be prohibitively expensive but they're still quite a bit more expensive. And so the today, again, my personal view is that I think it's probably more cost-effective to order an exome now. And then if you don't solve the case and are ongoing needs to consider an exome and a, a genome, excuse me, a genome in a few years, then to order a genome now and hope that you can get more out of it in the future. But that's, that's a hard question to answer. Um, it will change. Genome is a better test. It will replace exome. Um, but whether that happens gradually or, or suddenly, I would say probably like more likely gradually. I, I think the transition from exome to genome will not be the sea change that happened when exome became available when before we had really nothing that had that scale of testing. I also want to compare exome for, uh, versus TRIO-based developmental disorder panels. A number of commercial labs offer um, TRIO-based, that means the panel is done on the person and you know, their, their parents um, uh, that in, they're basically testing all known you know, human disease genes, but it's not the whole exome. There are maybe 3000 genes. Um, you know, exome has some advantages because it will pick up new genes or, or genes that were newly discovered. And it might feel better to say that you did the biggest test, but there are disadvantages. Exome costs more, it can take longer. There's more consent involved because exomes can reveal unrelated health problems that families should make informed decisions about. And that might be limiting for clinics that don't have genetics professionals to help with the counseling. Um, exome is still limited by the person's, what we understand of the person's clinical presentation and by the current knowledge of genes. So exome is not because it tests all the genes of like perfect complete test. And every lab that does exome has to prioritize what they're gonna look at in detail. And it's limited in scope there in a way that's not up to us, it's up to the lab. These trio panels have some advantages, which is that their yield is close to exome because they're gonna look at the same genes the exomes look at. They're often faster and less expensive. They're easier to consent because they don't re reveal genetic diseases aside from the developmental disorder. And the, most labs offer the ability to add on the rest of the exome in the future if you need it. The disadvantages is it's not gonna pick up genes that haven't been discovered yet or are very recent it will miss other diagnoses the person might have that are not related to the developmental disorder. Um, and there, this might be an advantage. They're limited in scope in a defined way. 
you know, it's, it's bad that they're limited in scope because you might miss something that you didn't realize, but they're good because at least you know the genes that the lab analyzed. What I'll say kind of philosophically is that I, I don't lose sleep over whether an individual who clearly has a developmental disorder that should have genetic testing per guidelines, I don't lose sleep over um, whether they got a genome or an exome or was it this, you know, the, it's, I'm just glad that people get testing. I'm more worried about people who, who need, who should have testing by guidelines that don't get access to it or who have had um, testing that was really a long time ago and is now very out of date um, and, um, and should be updated, which I'll come to in a second. So, so philosophically, you know, I know this, this, um, this conference has spoken a lot about equity and I, there is a little bit of a tension between offering the best testing and offering everybody the testing that is appropriate for their clinical needs. And sometimes using tests like large panels or uh, again, a single person panels, no, large trio panels maybe could be appropriate um, or exome versus pushing the envelope that, that you might be able to get some more equity by having the testing be more accessible. And so I just wanna be, be put in that little philosophical tidbit there. Um, I'm not gonna talk about adults very much because I know Dr. So is speaking later and is gonna talk about um, developmental disorders. I know she's an adult specialist. Needless to say, uh, children who grow up into adults and have developmental conditions um, have the same conditions they did when they were children and are, have the same diagnostic yield. Um, and so I think it's very appropriate to evaluate adults um, you know, as needed. Uh, in my own practice, I frequently see adults in this context because their siblings are planning to have children and want to know if this is an inherited disorder. And I think it's a very appropriate reason to diagnose somebody, even if they're 30 and no one's thinking about you know, trying to treat them you know, in, in a way that um, you know, major, has a major impact on their, on their um, you know, intellectual ability. There are new emerging technologies um, for developmental disorders. I'm not going to um, uh, go into these in depth, but uh, these are mostly research today, but they're coming. And I think that that, that that chart we saw earlier of the increasing diagnostic rate will continue to go up. We won't ever get to 100%, but I can see even in the next 10 years, um, a meaningful you know, in, increase in the yield because of some of these tests. Um, so I want to review. Um, Exome testing, or something like exome, a genome-wide broad sequence-based test, should be first, first or second line for developmental disabilities. So it is totally okay to order a microarray with or without Fragile X, and if it's negative, an exome. It is totally okay to just order an exome with or without Fragile X and not do a microarray if that, if that exome uh, reports uh, they do testing for copy number variation. What's not okay, which shouldn't happen anymore, is long lists of targeted tests, each of which only look for a very small number of disorders. These tests are great tests. I do these tests all the time, but they're really appropriate in settings where the clinical features specifically indicate that type of disorder, where that test is, is, is a good test. For a, a, a child or, or an adult with a developmental disorder, um, with no other specific features. These tests are very low yield and uh, contribute to a higher cost per patient that is not necessary. Um, oftentimes, you know, the order of testing has been flipped. So for example, I recently had a patient who had a genetic finding on an exome that was inconclusive, but it suggested a disorder for which transferrin isoelectric focusing would provide biochemical evidence that that was the diagnosis. And so these tests are sometimes now, often now, used kind of in the opposite order, where they, they're used to confirm the DNA findings instead of trying to guess what the person has doing tests that only test for a few conditions at once. So um, yeah, so th these huge workups, I think, are of the past unless there are specific features. Um, and then a few last points. Um, I, think I'm, I think I'm coming up with my time, so I will wrap up. So this can go. This can go perfect. This is why I left this not important stuff to the end. So the key points is for individuals with developmental delays or intellectual disability, early and comprehensive testing should be done. It's the most time and cost effective approach. Of course, it should be not so early that you don't even know if the person's delayed yet. It's not a screening test, but it should be done early. Um, exome genome or similar tests should be the first or second line test. TRIO is preferred with the parents. Genome is a better test and will replace exome, but there's, there's, it's more complicated than that. 
all genetic tests have limitations. They may need to be updated. Like I said before, if someone had testing 10 years ago, that testing is out of date. And if someone has testing now and 10 years from now, it will probably also be out of date. Exactly how much time has to go by before a test is out of date really depends, but it's something to keep in mind. And then there are areas of controversy and room for improvement. When should we test for milder? What do we do with autism, isolated autism or milder you know, ADHD or dyslexia, things like that? When, how often should we reanalyze and update testing? Like I, like I said, every year, every 10 years, there's probably a middle ground. Um, and then there's a lot of improvement to be made on public databases for normal and abnormal variants. Um, and then of course, uh, I think Dr. Enns will talk about right now, um, there's a lot of need now to advance our ability to treat, uh, treat disorders now that we've gotten better, not perfect, but better at diagnosing them. <laughs>